what I'd like to talk about to start with is, you know, is reflecting on, on what our mission is um, and to give a little bit of a backward look on what we've been doing and what we're planning to do over the next year or so, and then to identify um, where we as participants in the cluster at different levels can all work together to make that happen. So you don't wanna to listen to me all morning. Um, in fact, some of you are probably thinking we've already heard enough, Rupert. Uh, so I'm gonna break this session up. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of a start off and context around where we are in the, in the sort of skills planning area. I'm then gonna invite Mike just to do a really quick recap of what he briefed um, at uh, Secure Southwest um, and really sort of the highlights and key points about the things that we've done in Cyber Futures 2, which is the project we've just finished delivering, um, and to then give us a view of, of, of maybe a few thoughts around going forward. I've then invited um, one of my own team, D Dave Owen, um, who's principal consultant and, and also head of our IT at C3 Solutions, um, who has been involved as a delivery partner in delivering the training to um, South Devon College. And I thought it'd be useful to hear what his perspective is of having been a trainer um, and what the sort of you know pros and cons and benefits are um, to that as well. So um, so that should give us a, a good 15 minutes or so of content uh, and a good range of different perspectives. So for me, I'm just going to set that sort of not quite strategic but broader context of what we're trying to achieve in the cluster. Um, the top couple of lines here, those are straight off our website. You know, these are the things that this is our mission. This is our purpose. Um, here in the Southwest region to try and do these things, you know, the three parts, you know, business protection and um, innovation uh, from the cyber perspective. And then what I've highlighted in green, improving that skills development. And what I've done here is just, you know, put a few data points um, that are quite, some of them are more recent than others, but it shows you know, where, what our problem, you know, what our challenge is, not a problem, but it's a challenge to us in the Southwest. So, so firstly is that, you know, we don't have a very large part of the cyber sector nationally. Um, and DCIT have just released um, the 2023 cyber sectoral analysis. There's a link at the slide, at the bottom of the slide here, you can Google it and find it. Um, and those first two pictures on the left, you know, our, our share of offices and businesses and where they are located are directly from that report. And so even though you know, some perspectives where people will go, oh, well, the Southwest is well catered for, because they're thinking around those hotspots around Bristol and around Cheltenham. But actually, you know, you look further west from where we are, it's, it's a huge void um, of, of cyber business. Um, and yet there are still lots of businesses and other organizations that have the requirement for cybersecurity, but probably aren't, don't know how to access it or don't even know it. And so that's our challenge. You know, how do we, how do we grow um, our ecosystem here in the Southwest? How do we make um, more cyber capability available to businesses and increase their awareness and demand? Um, and then how do we also try and spread that a little more equally across the region? And it is a challenge because, sorry, I've got three more people in the waiting room. I'll just stop a second. Morning, those are just joining. Sorry if I keep waiting a little while because I'm trying to talk at the same time. Um, uh, and, and there is a challenge as perception as well, um, which we've experienced uh, in the cluster working across the other clusters in the country, that sometimes the Southwest gets grouped in with this wider perception of the South, um, you know, that we're all really well off down here in the Southeast and the South Central and the Southwest. Um, and in fact, uh, and, and certain other regions, which, which you know, are, are also in a, in a challenging condition, will present that as it's, it's, you know, the, there's this disparity between the two. And of course the devil is in the detail. And therefore I would you know, absolutely recommend that people get into the detail um, as to what that really means, because this is what the picture really is. And I think if you look on the right-hand side, um, which is a little old now, but the most um, up-to-date one I can find, which is the indices of deprivation. Um, and it looks at seven different areas, which are on that some um, sort of central slide, the central picture of the three. And then it maps those down to uh, quite small areas, actually. Um, and you can see on that sort of heat map, if you like, on the bottom right, that actually in the Southwest as a whole, we are have amongst us some of the most deprived areas in the country. And absolutely, there are some um, equally or even more deprived areas in some of the cities, 
certainly in some of the industrial spots in the industrial heartlands, um, in, in sort of you know, Midlands and North, and certainly up in the Northeast as well. So I'm not saying that we're any different, but I think that people don't necessarily understand that. And so it's against this context that we need to start to build our skills. And we need to do that for two reasons. We need to build that so that we can offer um, you know, careers and exciting opportunities to, to the people that live in our region, not just young people, but career changes as well. Um, but also we need to build those skills and hope that those people will wish to stay in the areas where, where maybe they currently live or, or were born and grew up so that that will develop our ecosystem. This isn't an overnight project, right? This is gonna take years um, and is almost a generational type of thing. But if we understand where we are now, then the, the work that we want to do here in the cluster is to do what we can to support that mission. And it's not, you know, we're not going to be able to lead on it all. We don't have the resources currently um, to be able to do that, but we can start to push the needle in the right direction. And that's what um, we, we're currently doing um, in terms of how, thinking how do we move ahead from what we've done so far. Let's roll on. There we go. Oh, I've got Monty Far, my one Monty Far. No, we can cool. So, um, so Paul, uh, Paul Hancock, um, who's another volunteer in the cluster and being a sort of skills coordinator, um, he, he briefed this slide back in January, and I'm not going to go through it all again. Um, but this captures the range of initiatives which we've supported or trying to support over the last couple of years. Uh, and considering you know, what we are in terms of voluntary organisation and the resources and funding we get, sorry, Tony, let me let you in. Um, it, uh, I think that's actually a really positive story to tell. We've definitely learned some lessons about how to do it better. Um, and I'm not gonna to touch on those so much, but, but Mike might do later on. Um, and so we're still looking across all of these areas and, and other partners that we can work with to say, you know, how can we carry on building the ecosystem and fostering this skills development in, in the region? Um, I'm probably gonna focus now a little bit more on that sort of second one down, the cyber futures piece, which is just, mainly because it's a bit of active planning that we're currently doing and, and I definitely need your help to do it. Yeah, computer, my computer is definitely maxed out and hosting, recording, doing everything else. Um, so, so where are we now? Well, this is our sort of project development sort of cycle, really. Um, last year, I think, was very much one of discovery and we now understand much better um, how to work in the context that we currently are. And that context, what I mean by that is how we sit um, within government and within the region. So you'll, those who have been involved with the cluster a long time will know that you know, two or three years ago, we really received no funding whatsoever. Um, DCMS as they were a couple of years ago, started to deliver funding and, and that stood up the UKC3, which is a, a cluster collaboration, the national body that helps us and works with us. And therefore we received some funding from them. And we received an operational funding which is literally you know, the life, blood and supply for, for, for the cluster um, and, and to make sure that we can run properly and have the correct levels of governance in place to be able to manage that money from the government. And then we also have project funding, which we, which we bid for, which allows us to deliver specific things. So the cycle as it works, because of the way that government funding works, actually the year starts in June and flows through till the end of May next year. And so as we come to the end of this current year, we're now doing this project development, which is that identifying the initiatives and what we're going to need um, to be able to fund that, then obviously seeking to, to detail, then we then move on to this sort of funding element, which is going to go into the next couple of months, which is detailing the, the projects we want to do um, in a proper project initiation sort of documentation um, and seeking funding, hopefully securing funding, and then moving us to mobilize with a view that we would then start to be delivering more, more actively in the period sort of September to April. Now that's based around a school year, but it's not exclusive to that. And if there's other project initiatives we develop that, that might start earlier or be in other environments, then, then certainly we can do that. And then as we come to the end of it, we'd look at saying, okay, what, what went well? How can we improve that? And we start the cycle again. That's what we're trying to get to this year in terms of a more formal process. It's challenging because we're all volunteers. We've got some demands on our time and we're probably a bit behind where we need to be at the moment on this. Um, but we're still further ahead than we've been in the past. So at the moment, we are, um, we're, we're on the right edge uh, of it. Um, 
And I think, you know, Michael probably touched on these a little bit, but but the, the way we had to work last year was pretty reactive. You know, we were offered funding to be able to do things um, and therefore we developed some projects and made them happen. So that, you know, that was great news, but it wasn't necessarily always the optimum experience for, for those that were going to help and support, you know, be it schools, teachers um, or other organisations or the delivery partners. Um, but I do think that, you know, we've, we've also realised that there's actually a real opportunity for those organisations. And it doesn't just have to be cyber, right? It can be IT organisations as well in our region um, can, can really make a huge impact in terms of their corporate citizenship uh, across the region. And for those of us that work into the public sector, we'll be more than familiar with the social value and procurement notices, which which actually, you know, that's going to affect how you're perceived and how you score and how you win work is how much you do from a sort of corporate citizenship perspective. And this skills development and supporting areas of deprivation and giving up equal opportunity and, and the like um, are real critical factors of that. So so I would, you know, if you've not looked at that and it's an area that you work, I would definitely recommend you take a view and, th and think maybe how how working with the cluster can help us as the cluster deliver but also help you as a business too um, and that really brings me to the end of my piece which is you know a little bit of a request yeah um, we've had some amazing companies who have jumped on board at short notice over the last couple of years to help us deliver projects um, and uh, and we're going to hear from you know, what what that experience was later on in this chat but we're always going to need more if we want to do more we're going to need partners that are willing to give their time um, and some of their people probably freely to support us deliver this stuff. You know, you know, we can pick up some of the costs in terms of admin and, and travel and the like. But um, but but unfortunately, you know, when we talk about funding, it's really funding around the, the ecosystem get, to get it going rather than unfortunately making this all um, you know, paid work for businesses. So so we're really looking for, for dev, definitely looking for delivery partners to help us do more. And also just more generally, you know, seeing that map of what it looks like in the Southwest, we've got to work so hard to tell people about um, cyber and about the cluster and to do outreach um, across the region, that that is going to be a big strand um, of our activity going forward as well. And, mm -hmm. and ironically, you know, if you're in a region which is already quite well represented, people are informed and they, and, and they may be more competitive in some respects, but you're not necessarily starting from such a low awareness level. Um, and yet we have that challenge. So that's my piece really. Um, I'm gonna put some contacts up here for a second, uh, which is just to, I'll just quickly run down them. But if if you feel that you know, you'd like to have a conversation about any things I've said, you know, please, you know, please do you know, get in touch um, and, and, and do copy it to multiples because we're all volunteers. And some of us have real trouble with our um, see, with our cluster email. Um, if you copy it to multiples, then definitely uh, it will get picked up and action in, in really quick time. And I think, you know, let me signpost a few people then. So Paul, as I said, yeah, he's definitely leading our skills. He's done an amazing job, completely, you know, main, almost completely voluntary. Um, and, and we really rely on him. Obviously, this myself. And then there's the two other directors, Jeff um, and Anthony, uh, who you can also contact. And then also, because you're going to hear from Mike, and Mike has... You know, lots of detail and lots of experience in this space. Um, uh, his email is there at the bottom as well. Okay, um, Mike, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, ask you to say a few words, if you would. Uh, thanks very much, Rupert. So it's a wonderful um, backdrop. Um, uh, as Rupert has, uh, has been talking about, Cyber Futures 2 is, is the second pilot that has been funded by government. The first came by UKC3, um, and the second came by a DCMS, now DSIT. Um, on both occasions, we were provided with about two weeks notice to, to launch the program. Uh, it was considered uh, an ad hoc use of excess budget that needed to be spent. So it, it, it placed massive stress on all of those parties involved. Um, the intent of this second pilot was to, to carry on the good work from the first, which was run at a single college. Um, the second pilot sought to uh, identify whether the model could be sustained across multiple colleges. So taking a pilot from a single college and rolling that out. 
The second objectives was to identify whether we could secure partner support to uh, facilitate the programme and to provide a, a rewarding learning journey for students. Um, and the third, from a DSIT perspective, was to understand, is this a model that could be replicated across other cold spot regions? So they're always seeking to identify things that can scale. Uh, we're incredibly fortunate that, you know, the cluster does have close trusted relationships uh, with the SME partners and, um, you know, at two or three days notice, we were able to secure four partners to, to support each year group that we were working with. Um, and about six working days to prepare everyone to launch the programme the, the first, second week of January. So it's not a great time to start. Um, but we but we achieved this and, and that's testament to um, those people uh, at an executive level within, within our SME partners uh, that committed to something they didn't know much about. They knew it was the right thing to do and and wanted to make it happen, wanted to make a difference. Um, you know, out of this, we we've identified some key recommendations which, which would be that we would seek wherever possible particularly in the southwest to identify uh, a small number of enterprise employers who, who might be willing to support the smes you know that there, there there is scale there are you know we know a number of smes that would um if they heard the right story and the right person in the organization understands that the impact both to the employer and to the community uh, be very keen to help. Um, it's very useful for students and parents and colleges uh, to see a brand name associated with a with any project. That's not to say we would we would ex we would expect the enterprise community to uh to do a lot of stuff we we would still wish for, for the smes to be involved um another recommendation in terms of the curriculum planning would be that we would provide our um, partners with the opportunity to contribute to what the curriculum looked like so you might hear from from dave in a minute his view on the the content of the curriculum um, but actually what we found is that it's very useful for partners to, to be a part of that curriculum planning process. And likewise for the colleges, we found there was a, a fair amount of disparity across the three colleges that we worked with being South Devon, Exeter and Plymouth UC, UTC in um, the capabilities of those student cohorts. Uh, and in particular, uh, the teacher in the classroom is the gatekeeper you know that teacher has to feel confident that this is having a positive impact on their students for a program to be sustainable and for them to want it to happen the following year um, in addition to executive buy-in that the, the buy-in at all levels of education uh, was was really critically important to making this happen um, you know we're very pleased that every single college would want this to continue right they see this as being a, an incredibly tangible benefit to uh, the students learning journey not just in terms of their skills development but their motivation in classes their attendance and behavior their engagement with real industry professionals that are not teachers or parents but real people yeah is incredibly rewarding for these students um, I think that the last recommendation that, that we would make to DSIT would be that we would like more than two weeks uh, notice to launch a programme. And the absolute minimum would be three months in order for us to, to make it happen and feel confident that we could execute and, and manage the quality of the delivery. Uh, not least for, you know, those professionals that are going into the classroom and meeting the students. You know, these guys are on the front line. It's generally outside of people's comfort zone with sufficient time uh, to be onboarded and trained and to prepare for delivery, these professionals uh, can execute uh, you know, an incredibly engaging uh, workshop or session. 
So those, those would be key recommendations. In terms of the results, we, you know, we, had, some, we had some KPIs we had to achieve. Um, in the short term, uh, we were tasked with engaging with a minimum of 50 students and, and we were able to engage with uh, 66 students across, across the three colleges. Um, DSIT wanted us to, to ensure that we were working with a, a minimum of 25% of the students that were from socially disadvantaged backgrounds. And actually it's almost a third were um, you know, from those, um, from those backgrounds. And we achieved something incredible, which was 98% attendance uh, across our workshops, which uh, teachers don't expect in a normal classroom. So, so this meant that the kids were wanted to give up their extra hour and a half a week in order to attend these sessions because they recognized the value to them. And, and for me, that that is the most critical uh, statistic. Right? The kids want this. You know, they, this is not being forced upon them. They're not doing it for a grade. They're doing it because they enjoy it. They found it to be stimulating. They saw the value of developing these skills and they voted with their own time to ensure that they could take advantage of it. We secured glowing feedback and, and we were somewhat tentative about, how, you know, how optimistic we should be given the short term timescales. But, you know, the goal was, was based upon a net promoter score. Right? How, many, how many children and, uh, and their teachers would, would score it eight or more out of 10? We achieved this with, with just over eight. How many students would consider a cyber career? over 50% of the students that we engaged with would now consider a cyber career. This is a ridiculous potential conversion rate. Um, virtually every student um, admitted that they now had an increased awareness of cyber and how valuable that would be in whichever IT career they pursued, whether that be games development or working in the cloud or wanting to write software. Okay? This is, this is a huge part of the long tail cyber resilience for our communities and, and our industry. Every student going through a college becomes cyber aware and, and does things safe by design. Um, critically, the last two points, um, over 50% of students uh, were, this was the KPI, would continue the program and actually, we, we scored well over 75%. So there is ongoing demand. Students would want to do this in their second year if it was available. Every single college said, please, can we continue the programme? And lastly, those industry partners that, that recognised the value in it would, would want to continue. So these three key, key stakeholder groups all want this to continue. Um, and this is such a large part of why the cluster is, is sort of focused on wanting to make this happen. So here endeth my summary. Uh, I think if I would make one last point, it would be that if we were to link this into Cyber First, which is the school's program, each of these colleges would want to become a Cyber First college. They would attain the gold status based upon this program being delivered. And that would massively raise uh, you know, the, the perceived success of the Southwest region uh, across central government and the impact that we're having. So thank you very much for your time. I think Dave's going to give the, uh, the on the ground perspective now. Yeah, no, thanks, Mike. That, that was really helpful um, and, uh, and some really key points, but we'll, we'll wrap up at the end. So, yeah, Dave, um, over to you, if that's right. Yeah, thank you, Rupert. Um, so I'm Dave and I work for CFIA, Principal Consultant. I also head up the, uh, the company's IT, and I'm also a cyber auditor, uh, technically, so vulnerability assessments, cyber essentials, and all that sort of good stuff. So what we were expected to do as a company was, was myself and I may add there was uh, two others, and we, we taught varying subjects myself. Um, and, th and these were one hour, 15 minute sessions, and I covered cloud fundamentals, network scanning and uh, credentials, so password hacking. So quite a varied subject range, really. And that was all based on the Immersive Labs uh, Mitre attack framework. 
Um, as Mike alluded to, we didn't really have that much time to to to, to start really, uh, so we had to um, you know get us ducks in a row and deliver the best we could. So you know how how I did it. Um, well, first I did the labs myself because um, obviously I might I might think I know everything, but you know a lot of these skills we don't use every day, so I had to revise myself. Um, I chose to teach in person where possible. I did two on site in uh, South Devon and I did one remotely uh, due to other business. Um, but I thought being in person, it, you know, I wanted them to know who I was and I wasn't just reading off, off, off Google and just blurting it out. And I actually stood there and I knew what I was talking about and that gained their trust in me uh, and I also wanted the teacher's confidence, as again, Mike alluded to, uh, that I could stand there and, and, and deliver a quality, a quality session to, to his learners. Um, again, there was varied backgrounds. Um, some, some guys, you know, were obviously very clever, uh, but didn't really know what they were doing with their life, I don't think. You know, they were still at that young stage obviously very very technically talented uh, naturally uh, and then there was a lot of the class I'd probably say at least 40 to 50 percent of that class were, were obviously underprivileged uh, there's no doubt about it um, I treated them on a level at all times and, and taught them like adults uh, which they appreciated uh, I wasn't talking down to them I was you know when I was when I was teaching I was getting feedback off them all the time and getting them to answer the questions instead of me talking all the time um, and you, you're only going to get this sort of um, this, this two-way thing if, if you, unless you do it in person um, the lesson you know obviously again Mike said you know to the time to, to prepare for these lessons because I, as I said I did the labs myself but um, you know the subject matter on the labs is quite minimum. Um, so what I did is I, I bolstered that out in, into a roughly about 20 to 25 minute power presentation to really, you know, add ingredients to the lesson and make it so so they understand what they're doing, but why they're doing it and, and how it's how it's like, that's going to function in, into the real world. Um, I also kept some stuff in, the, in my back pocket just in case some of the whiz kids flew through the labs and I was stood there twiddling my thumbs for 20 minutes, which I didn't, I didn't, luckily I didn't have to do. Um, you know, I, I worked, I worked them hard. Um, but, you know, you're talking about probably about two hours prep for, for each one of these and obviously the travel, but, you know, I, I found it was worth it. Um, some of this extra information I added as well, for me doing the labs, I could see, I think, I was thinking, well, the, these young uns, that they're not going to be able to complete this lab because they haven't been taught how to do the extra bits. For example, uh, credential scanning, so hacking passwords. You know, it's all well and good you've hacked the password or what you're going to do with it. Um, you know, and that's then then creating an SSH connection to a target host to um, to enumerate that target host with the passwords you just cracked. So. I introduced how to do the Linux command lines for SSH connections and various other bits and bobs and how to get the information from the target end um, to, you know, and, and it just added that extra and it gave them more ability and made, made, made their labs um, more achievable and they got more out of it. So it was, I think that's, the, you know, that's one perspective. You need, it's, it's all well and good what's in the lab. You just need to just think out of the, out of the box a little bit which, you know, they really, really appreciated. Um, when I was doing, the, when they were doing the labs, uh, I was constantly walking around, you know, different skill sets, some very clever people that just whizzed through them. Some really struggled. Uh, so it was totally a new concept to them. So I pretty much do one-to-one -one support probably for about 40, 45 minutes to an hour just going around and, and, and speaking to each individual and helping them with the lab, uh, which, you know, again, they really appreciated. And they actually like, you know, enjoyed and looked forward to, to me and my colleagues going on site 
to deliver these lessons because the knowledge they gained and the understanding was just tenfold. Um, also produce handouts as a bit of an extra, you know, cheat sheets for, for network scanning, for Linux commands, pointed in the direction of different websites and things so I could do extended learning. I gave them network security books, PDF versions that they could read in their own time to again, bolster their knowledge. So overall, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoy the experience. It's something I've never done. Um, I have taught quite a lot in my past. Um, I was at home, I make military, you know, it's, it's not something new to me, but doing this is a totally different concept. You know, enjoyed meeting the learners, different backgrounds, different people that don't usually move in my social arena. Again, meeting the teachers, uh, met a multitude of teachers that, you know, they were so genuinely pleased that we'd gone on site to teach and you know, they didn't expect it. And they were so appreciative. And just passing the knowledge on to others, um, you know, just to hopefully steer some people in the right direction, uh, in, whether, whether that means to an IT, an IT uh, trade or, or cybersecurity trade or information insurance or governance or, or whichever, uh, you know, because there's a lot of hid, hidden talent. There was one guy, uh, long hair, hood up, you know, your typical hacker, you know, I wouldn't give him my Wi-Fi password, I can assure you, because he'd be in there, not a problem. But, you know, if he steers us off in the right direction, he's going to be such an asset to somebody, you know, absolutely so clever. And it's all just natural. It, it was also, you know, great to give them confidence in their own ability because I, I think with their backgrounds, a lot of them didn't have that confidence. And by me doing the way I taught, you know, you know my method, they, they just you know, came out of their shells. Um, they uh, confided in me. Some of them were telling me about their backgrounds, which is horrific on, on some parts, but, you know, to, I'd got that trust and that relationship, that rapport with them. Um, and it's just, you know, just making a difference, which, I, you know, I, I, that, 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 was, that was it for me, really. Um, and I think Mike's off the call now, but I have, a, I have had a, a feedback session with TechEd. And overall, I think it's really good, really good, you know, considering the time it took to put in place. But I think one of the improvement things, which, you know, I, I, I fed back anyway, was uh, just the scheduling um, and to build up slowly. You know, for example, colleague Lucy taught, you know, cyber safety, then I taught cloud fundamentals. And the next lesson, the hacking passwords with no Linux command line experience. So I think slowly slowly maybe a bit of linux in the background first so they've got a basic understanding so they can complete the labs um so you're going to start wrapping up a bit actually so yeah yeah no problem um did the extra things uh, cloud fundamentals i showed them at my network which put it into a real world context during the scanning i showed them using nessus pro scanning software we use in industry uh, on a target device showed them the vulnerabilities now to remediate them which it just the penny dropped really. So overall benefits to myself, it took me well out of my comfort zone, which was good. And it gave me an extra skill set, you know, teaching at sixth form really, uh, and to be able to put into my CV and, and, and build on my experience as an instructor. That's me. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, that was really, so I'm not going to do a little massive summary because we're sort of moving, even though there's only two of us, we, we've definitely bl blasted our time on that one, um, partly my fault. But I think, you know, hopefully what came out of that was, was the real value that the students put on it in terms of the, the, the scores and the things and, and how we can try and continue this. And you know, there's definitely a demand signal for this. Um, and then obviously the, the flip side of that is, you know, what is the benefit to the, to the individuals and the companies that are doing it?